There's a blue background with faint grid lines that look like the canvas for a technical drawing, like a blueprint. The word ACCESS in all caps, WHITE, TWICE. One access is made of a dotted outline. The other is solid text with arrows around some of the letters, suggesting future edits or movement. A survey of contemporary U.S. disability aesthetics, July 21, 2023. Okay, hello. Welcome to a survey of contemporary U.S. disability aesthetics. This event is part of a series called Access Access, offered by Creatives Rebuild New York. Hello to those in this Zoom space right now, and hello to the time shifters of the future who are watching this recording later on. Welcome. My name is Kevin Gotkin. I am an artist organizer with CRNY. I am a white person with a mustache and short brown hair, gold jewelry, a uh, summery linen shirt, and there are white walls in the room behind me and a window. I am coming to you from the traditional territory of the Mohican people, so-called Hudson, New York, which is and has been the site of multiple indigenous movements. So let's access the access for this access access series. For the next few minutes, we will settle into this space. Then I will introduce the topic of today's session, looking at how artists are using disability in new ways of making art. I will invite three guests to share what they are noticing about contemporary disability aesthetics. After that, I will invite you to contribute your expertise and your questions, and then we'll depart. In the chat right now, I am dropping the link to our participation guide. And this is where you can find more detailed information about each of the access features we are activating during this session. So let me introduce to you the team of iconic legendary, fabulous access workers who are collaborating with me to hold this space for us all. Irene Gotera is at work now offering Spanish language interpretation. Our interpreters today are Liang and Sarah. They are deaf interpreters. I'm excited that we are offering this form of access today because deaf interpretation features a higher level of cultural and linguistic detail in ASL. Our interpreters will switch off in their spotlights if you need multi-pin access for those in the Zoom space right now, let us know. Our captioner today is Jane Arau. You can toggle the captions on and off 
from the bottom of your Zoom window. You can also find the stream text for browser-based captions, including Spanish captions in the participation guide. Our audio describer today is Madison Zalopani, and I will pass it over to her to introduce herself. Thank you, Kevin. My name is Madison Zalapani. My pronouns are she and they. My video is turned off. And in my Zoom box is the audio description icon. White text on a black background. Capital A, capital D with three curved lines radiating, radiating outward to the right. Today, I will be describing visual content and reading out the chat. Please be mindful that we would like to read all of the messages. So if the pace picks up, we may ask for a pause so we can catch up and thought. This is Kevin speaking. Thank you, Madison. Our access doula for today is a Seth, and I will pass it to them to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. This is Seth speaking. I'm speaking to you from Kashaya Pomo territory. First word, K-A-S-H-I-A. -A. Second word, P-O-M-O. -O. In Northern California, I use they, them pronouns. And I am a light-skinned Black person with long, thin braids falling from under a mustard colored beanie. I'm wearing gold facial jewelry and a purple striped t-shirt sitting in front of a white wall with diffuse sunlight. My role today as the access doula will be to monitor the flow of the event, manage technical features of the Zoom as needed, and I'm available for one-on-one -on -one support to help make sure that your access needs are met. My job is to make sure that the container we are sharing is working for you. I will also be available to meet you in our doula space and low stim breakout room. After I finish introducing the room, it will be open. And this is a space where you can go to connect with me it's a separate space from the main room. It's also a low stimulation space if you need somewhere to chill. And if you would like to go to this room and you don't find the way to enter, please send me a message and we will assign you. End thought. This is Kevin speaking. Thank you, Seth and our doula space and low stim breakout room is now open. And as Seth said, let us know if you don't have that option or you need us to assign you into that space. We will also offer notation artistry from this session by Jez Chung. Jez will be turning this session into a visual map that we will include in the follow-up materials. And then last for our access team is me and I will facilitate this event. I will keep track of time 
and I will make any changes to the Zoom configuration as necessary. If you feel unsafe at any time, please contact us immediately. If we are collectively unsafe, we may abruptly end this meeting and reconstitute the session with a new Zoom link in the participation guide. I invite you to disrespect etiquette to enhance your access, to bring your most exquisite self to this space, to stim and move and engage as you need, and to let me know if there is anything the facilitation team can do to support you. So let's take a pause you might surface a sensation in your body-mind, follow your breath for a second, or come deeper into the awareness of your access ecology right now. Okay, so welcome to a survey of contemporary US disability aesthetics. Let me break down the title a little bit as I introduce this topic. So far in the series, we have looked at access from many sides. Today, I wanted to give a focus to how access is used in how we make art. So we're about to offer a survey, not the survey, nothing definitive or comprehensive. We will offer some entry points to the growing field of disability artistry. In my role as an organizer in this field over the last seven years, I have started to learn that some people are feeling left out of the spotlight that disabled artists sometimes receive. And I want to draw our attention to that. It helps us think about how cultural institutions might be lifting up some artists and not others. We need researchers and organizers who can help us do the thorough work to recognize and cherish everyone who contributes to our field. So a survey about contemporary US artistry. I wanted to be specific about what we're talking about since we don't have so much time, but we should note that disability artistry is not only contemporary. I think we'll learn about that soon in this session. Um, in fact, some have made the case that it is one of the oldest things about humanity. But something new occurred when disabled people started organizing in the last few decades to produce work in the name of disability. And since this is not the same everywhere, I also wanted to specify that we'll be looking at the US, but as you'll soon notice, it might be better framed as Turtle Island to use a traditional name that existed before the so-called United States and goes beyond borders, especially the US-Canada border. So a survey about contemporary Turtle Island disability aesthetics. 
what do we mean by disability aesthetics? There is a lot of writing about this term, not much of it written in plainer language. So I'll give a very big overview to say, some people think of disability aesthetics as a really big thing, like the way bodies feel in the presence of other bodies. And others want to specify that disability aesthetics are about artworks produced with the lived experience of disability. I will leave some links for more reading in our follow-up materials. For now, let's think of disability aesthetics as artworks and the way we engage with them as they relate to disability. I am excited now to introduce you to three people who think a lot about disability aesthetics across Turtle Island. I will introduce each of them very briefly so I can take up last time, and they will talk for a few minutes to contribute to our survey. Up first, Emily Watlington. Emily is a critic, curator, and senior editor at Art in America. Emily seems to be everywhere in New York art worlds, her work is defined by a commitment to studying and showcasing disability artistry, which is why I am delighted that she is joining us today. So Emily, welcome. And let me spotlight you. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much, Kevin, for that generous introduction and framework. Um, I'm really excited to share um, some sort of some works I consider foundational works of, of disability artistry. Um, and just to describe myself briefly, I'm a white woman with shoulder length messy curly light brown hair um and i'm sitting on a red couch and wearing like a a patterned blouse with like lime green splotches and i'm wearing glasses um and i'm going to share some images on the screen um maybe i'll introduce a little bit and then we can describe the first one uh, we're so often told that artists help us see the world differently. But when we look at art history, um, at some of the most famous, quote unquote, important artists, it's easy to see how often this is quite literally true, meaning so many famous um, canon changing artists like Monet, Renoir, Degas, and Georgia O'Keeffe were blind or low vision, and this greatly impacted their work, which in turn impacted other artists and the trajectory of art history. So I'll talk about Claude Monet first, whose work is on the screen. This gestural painting with swirls that dance, forming the images of a small bridge curved over a placid body of water and water lilies. Um, Claude Monet is, you know, one of the most famous artists in the world. He lived from 1840 until 1926. He's a French Impressionist. 
Um, a hundred years ago, he underwent surgery to quote unquote correct the cataracts that had been increasingly blurring his vision for a decade or two. And then after his surgery, um, though his vision did sharpen, colors continued to appear dull and cool. You can see this um, in the canvases he made as he neared that surgery and then after the operation. So the painting on the screen called the Japanese Bridge, Point Japonaise from between 1918 and 24. Um, looking at it, one assumes that the vibrant chartreuse and heavy dabs of, of crimson must have looked slightly more naturalistic to him. Remember he saw colors. <clears throat> excuse me, as being cool. <clears throat> also, this color palette is so unusual and so different from his earlier iridescent pastel palettes. Um, excuse me, perhaps some of you might know his famous water lilies or haystacks. Um, in the next slide, um, Weeping Willow from 1921 to 22. Um, gestural lines blurred the image until it veers into, it's basically an abstraction. The audio describer agrees the shades of greens, purples, and browns swarm around each other, imitating the curved branches of a willow tree. Thank you. But without the title as a guide, willow tree, I think the, you know, the tree-like nature of the arching brushstrokes would be hard to recognize. Um, this past year, there was this blockbuster traveling show that compared Monet's work with that of the abstract expressionist, Joan Mitchell. Um, and when I saw that show, the enduring impact of Monet's vision hit me like a brick, like, I mean, both his literal vision and his artistic vision, which were inextricable for a plein air painter like Monet. Um, the show made as plain as day, the fact that Monet's late work, so his cataract work, had a profound impact on abstraction, on the history of painting. And this influence prompted Elaine de Kooning, who was um, a painter and a critic, to coin the term abstract impressionism. Um, the Abex movement took off across the pond a couple decades later after Monet's death. And it's clear that Monet charted some kind of path for the movement. Um, there's also a big Georgia O'Keeffe show on view right now at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I just pulled up a slide of her work. A burnt umber colored cylinder shaped sculpture with a wide base that tapers towards the neck stands erect. The show at MoMA is called To See Takes Time. And when I saw that title, I was really excited. And I thought, finally, we're gonna talk about Georgia O'Keeffe's blindness. Um, in the 1970s, when the artist was around 80 years old, um, her macular degeneration prompted her to take a break from painting and try out sculpture. Um, she began working tactilely with her hands, with clay, um, before eventually innovating new ways to, to work on paper and on canvas again. Um, but she was encouraged to keep quiet about her blindness because her dealer worried it would make her work less valuable. Um, in the show, there is one painting that she made while blind, but it's not on the checklist or in the catalog. And it's displayed in more of a stairwell than a gallery. And that's in part because it's from a different time period than what the show focuses on. But I bring that up because if you go, you should make sure not to miss it. Um, 
It's called From a Day with Juan Two from 1977. And it's part of a series of canvases that she made that shows a foreshortened rectangular gray gradient extending upward into a blue sky. And she made about a dozen similar paintings. I have one on the screen right now. Um, and for Art in America, I put together a slideshow of other works that she made after going blind, and I'll drop a link in the chat in case you want to see them or read the alt text descriptions on the website. Um, these works, I think, speak to the astonishing persistence of her artistic vision, which outlived her ocular one. Um, I wanted to bring these two artists into the conversation about disability arts um, to show that it's by no means a new movement, but in fact, the vital contributions of disabled, of disabled people to art history has been tremendous and canonical. Um, disability has profoundly shaped the course of art history time and again in all realms from basements to the blockbuster shows. Um, and as Kevin points out, of course, there's this distinction between artists claiming disability as a political act um, and allowing their impairments to inform the work for political reasons and those who maybe would not even self-identify as disabled or lived in another context where the politics of doing so meant something different than they do now. Um, but still, too often, the history of innovations that were born of impairment, so for instance, the telephone or the curb cut, just get forgotten. And too often, blurred vision like Monet's or Georgia O'Keeffe's is described as bad or in need of correction, right? Um, gets labeled as a deficit, which makes no sense when it belongs to the most important artist in history who we want to show us how to see the world differently. Um, and too often, you know, we find ourselves looking for disability history in the margins, the people who were overlooked, but time and again, disabled people are right there in, in the canon and in the center. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This is Kevin. Thank you, thank you, Emily. I am smiling very widely. Um, thank you for that. And we are going to move right along. So I'll introduce our next guest. Sean Lee is the Director of Programming at Tangled Art and Disability in Toronto, where they were previously the organization's inaugural curator in residence, and then gallery manager. Sean is a global leader in the movement for disability arts. And I am delighted that they are here. So welcome, Sean. Thank you, Kevin. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a description of myself. So I'm somebody who's male presenting. I use he and they pronouns. I'm East Asian Chinese with relatively light skin. I'm also visibly disabled. So my back curves, my shoulders are uneven. And if we were meeting in person, you'd probably notice I'm quite short of stature. Uh, I've got on some kind of steampunk circle lens glasses. They're brown with these golden floating 
uh, rims. And I'm wearing a blue surgical mask and I'm in a black t-shirt. And as Kevin's mentioned, I'm the director of programming at Tangled Art and Disability. Tangled sign name is this. And um, Tangled is based in Toronto, uh, which originates from the Mohawk word Tecaranto, uh, which means the place in the water where the trees are standing. And Toronto is now governed under Treaty 13 between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Canadian government. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Two in gallery shots. On the left, there are parallel walls covered in black, white, blue, and pink graphic prints with repeating ornate patterns. The back wall is a kaleidoscope of portraits. In the center of the gallery, cushions lie on the floor. To the right, is gallery text and a TV monitor of a person signing in front of a green screen. I wanted to take a moment um, to just reflect on the words of disability activist, Catherine Frizee, who reminds us that disability history is about gleaning and claiming. And so having been at Tangled since the launch of our gallery space, um, I just wanted to share some of those gleanings that I've been privileged to be a part of. For those who are unfamiliar with our space, Tangled is an art gallery that's dedicated to showcasing artists from the mad, deaf, and disability community. So our approach is twofold as we exhibit artists and we also advance accessible curatorial practices. And to better understand my experiences with CRIP curatorial practices, um, I also wanted to start by prefacing that when I talk about quote unquote disability arts, um, that there is no single definition of what that is, um, but it's generally agreed among us at Tangled um, that disability arts is a very specific arts practice and movement, which involves disabled artists creating work that expresses our identities as disabled folk. Um, and disability arts also carries an additional dimension of meaning um, that as disability arts practitioners, we are collectively and individually contributing to this expression of a distinct disability culture, one that has you know, unique shared experiences and perspectives. And so I think of our site as a space for political engagement. And to better understand this, I'm gonna first turn to um, an exhibition um, with an artist named Gloria C. Swain. I'm just gonna to advance to the next slide. And... A white floating wall in a gallery with show text. The title reads, holding space. To the right of the wall text is a small monitor with a person signing and a pair of headphones. Thank you. So I turn to this exhibition uh, curated by Gloria C. Swain, uh, who was an artist in residence at Tangled initially, 
and was invited back to curate an exhibition in 2019. Gloria identifies as an aging Black mad woman, and her practice is one that opens up community conversations about Black mental health in response to an absence of anti-Black racist mental health services. And so in many ways, her curatorial practice was an extension of her practice of care. Now, during the process of this show, one of the artists selected for this group show um, wasn't able to attend the meetings um, or the prep sessions. And ultimately they decided to withdraw from the show. And rather than drop the artist, um, Gloria came to Tangled. We did some reworking together. We thought about the orientation of the space and the meaning of what she was trying to create. And so instead she made this wall here, a, a relatively empty wall uh, with just text and the statement, which essentially is about how neoliberal capitalist and sanest ableist systems exclude many artists, especially black, mad and disabled artists from cultural institutions. And so instead of essentially erasing the artists from the show, this wall was meant to help space for them and Tangled offered the artist a part of their artist fee and acknowledged them for the work that they did. And it began for us a real journey into understanding better practices for exhibition. And since then, we've gone on to include things like a care clause in our contracts with our artists that really are about um, helping folks to understand that no matter what deliverables, quote unquote, or um, statements have been put into a contract, these are never meant to supersede the health and well-being of an artist and a commitment to working together to create um, access, not just for audiences, but for the artists and to essentially reorient ourselves to a different way of being and creating as a, as a gallery. I move to the next slide here. Um, and I'll let the, uh, uh, the description from Madison first. A person with long layered hair seen from behind looks closely at an iPad on a tripod that is placed in front of six framed photographs. Manifesting disability culture has also meant rethinking the gallery um, in numerous ways, including digitally. And so since reopening our gallery, we've offered two alternative forms of attending the gallery. Uh, one are these iPad-led digital tours uh, where folks can book a, um, an exhibition tour and the other option is you can book a robot tour in which uh, you can drive your own robot into the space and um, essentially get to know more about the um, exhibition that's currently on. And because of time, I just wanna end it there with these two very short gleanings. But in the chat, what I'll do is I'll include a link um, to our current robot tour so that folks who are interested in attending our space can do so. Um, everything we do is free and I highly encourage folks to come check out our space digitally or in person. Thank you and I'll pass it back to you, Kevin. This is Kevin. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, yes, um, more links to come in our follow-up materials. And I just want to do a time check because I have put an impossible demand on our speakers to be so brief about so much 
material. So here's what we'll do. We have one more speaker um, who may speak past the hour mark. So if you need to leave, um, please do what you need. Um, we'll continue the recording. So if you need to leave and you want to experience the full survey or the, the guests' contributions here, then you can check back when I send out the follow-up materials and our access features will continue for 15 minutes after the hour. I will also follow up with a plan for how to engage everyone who's here because we're not getting to that fully and there's a different kind of craft to invite your contribution that I'm noticing throughout this series, I have not done the best job at cultivating that space. So I wanna to apologize to everyone for this time crunch, um, but we'll continue after the hour. If you need to leave, that is okay. And there will be more materials coming to your inbox next week. Okay. So our final guest is Terene Fazelli. Terene is a curator, writer, educator, and cultural organizer. Their show, and now a publishing project called Sick Time, Sleepy Time, Crip Time, Against Capitalism's Temporal Bullying, is a landmark in the field of disability arts. I am so glad that Terene could join us. So welcome, Terene. Let me just spotlight you. Hi, everyone. My name is Terene. As Kevin mentioned, I use she, her, they pronouns. Um, so just a little description of myself and starting. I'm a middle-aged medium brown-skinned Iranian-American femme, appearing person. I'm wearing a, a black dress that you can see the straps of. Behind me, you can see um, a plant, a green plant with um, big leaves. And I'm coming to you from Wauwiatanang, Detroit, also codenamed Midnight on the Underground Railroad. Um, yeah, and I just wanna thank uh, the Badass Access Support Team and Kevin for the invite. Um, I was originally just attending the programs to learn from y'all. Um, so I'm really excited to try and build on what Emily and uh, Sean shared in their brilliance. Um, much like Sean, uh, the contemporary examples I'll share are from some work I've done with artists um, from the exhibition and community project series that I um, curated that Kevin mentioned. Um, so the examples come from the show's two main prongs. One um, is artworks that use elements of disabled life as creative material, like crypt time, access, care, interdependency. And two, uh, artworks that resist the production of debility by racial oppression and American imperialism. Um, and so, um, as Kevin mentioned, I'm currently working on a field guide that's rooted in a project with artist Connick McBride, McBride, who is here today. So I just wanted to give a shout out. Hi, Connick. Um, so if we can cue the first image, um, I'll do a, um, an image description of the first one. So this work, uh, in this work, the artist lists the materials as a mattress topper, wood, and eight years of sleep with many. So this mattress topper that's used in Constantina Zapanzano's sculpture, I think we're alone now, host, 2016, was on the artist's bed for four years and then used subsequently as a guest mattress for another four years. So this bed bears the traces of the artist and friends, family, and friends of friends in the form of marks, tears, hair, bodily fluid, and other detritus. So I'm sharing this artwork 
as representative of two patterns that I see emerging in contemporary works. One, examination by artists of the site of the bed as a site of sociality and political action. And two, dependency and interdependency as artistic material. So um, Tina's artwork reminds us that reproductive activities such as sleep, rest, care, and sex are indeed constitutive of life. For many years, um, artists from Frida Kahlo to Felix Gonzalez Torres have used imagery of beds to investigate illness, intimacy, and disability. So um, to explain bed life, we'll drop some text into the chat and we'll sh uh, share these afterwards. Um, but as Talia and Heidi put it in one article that we'll be sharing, or oh, maybe I'll pause. Um, and before describing bed life, just describe this artwork. So in the image you're now seeing, it shows a frontal view of a sheet of yellow beige curved foam that's loosely held by a large rectangular wooden frame leaning backwards against a white wall. So um, on bed life, Talia and Heidi put it, bed life is a concept that refuses to submit to the persistent notion under neoliberal productivity timescales, that to be bedbound by chronic illness or disability is a form of social death and bare life. It is an emphatic reminder that despite and because of the ways we are bound to and by illness, we make possible diverse forms of life otherwise. So also in this artwork um, on using dependency and interdependency as material, the memory foam that Tina used is fundamentally defined by interdependency. Its relationship to others, their weight against it, heat, time spent with it, shapes it. This interdependency extends to the community it has held over the years. I was held myself by it when going through a flare of my illnesses and needing a place to stay. As I wrote in a love letter to the artwork- Hi, Tarane, can you please slow down? Yes, sorry about Thank that. Thank you. My New Yorker self speaks too fast. Um, so to the artwork, I said, you, firm yet malleable, you definitely hold your own, but don't hold out. So for time's sake, um, can we move to the second image, Kevin? So Madison, would you give me a hand in describing this image? This is a digital infographic looking illustration depicting two scenes. On the left, there's purple text that says, return to front porches. We see two people, one with dark brown skin reclining on a green bench, facing a person who is waving to them while seated in a wheelchair. On the right, looks like a house with bars across the windows and a surveillance camera above the door. Le below both images, there's text that reads, be seen, not watched, green chairs, not green lights, dot org. Thank you, Madison. Um, so I'll first, yeah, I think uh, it's nice to see how all three of us who are sharing from our work and the artworks that we um, draw inspiration from um, that in some ways we're all doing an expansion. Um, so I think that's interesting um, and different. And maybe we can get into that if there's any time at the end. But um, I'll say first that for me, disability aesthetics includes culture in addition to artwork. Um, and also drawing here, I think, um, you know, sick time worked with an understanding that many people often due to race or class do not have access to contemporary disability pride and may not identify as disabled, even though they have lived experience with what could be called disability. Um, so when Kevin asked me, what is a surprising work of disability aesthetics, that's not something we might readily identify as such. 
I immediately thought of the use of access material in artworks and cultural projects, um, access as material rather, um, but access um, beyond the clearly crip gathering techniques like captioning and interpretation, et cetera, um, which we didn't get to talk to today, but I think there's many examples of that that could be shared, um, like the Alt Texas Poetry Project by Shannon Bojana. Um, but uh, I think this form of access that I'm looking at is an abolitionist access that's a little bit differently rooted in race, class, and cultural specificity. So um, just one example, um, uh, started by Mama Myrtle and Baba Wayne Curtis, Feedem Freedom is a community farm and cultural space that's on Detroit's east side. Um, a Black Panther who worked on food, food programs back in the day, Baba Wayne was radicalized after he was, quote in his words, kidnapped to Vietnam. Living with the aftermath of being an agent of American imperialism um, and feeling the effects of anti-Black racism on him and his Senator, communities. Can you please slow down? Mm -hmm. Repeat what you were saying, please. Thank you. Yes. So Baba Wayne living with the aftermath of being an agent of an American imperialism and the effects of anti-Black racism on him and his communities, he's transmuted this through his art and cultural organizing. So uh, Detroit, the nation's largest majority Black city, has been strategically, structurally under-resourced due to waves of foreclosure, water shutoffs, and austerity. Many people have lost access to housing, healthy food, and clean water. This produces disability and debility, as we know. Feedom Freedom works with revered organizer, Grace Lee Boggs' idea that you must go an inch wide and a mile deep. One project they've, they're doing provides an alternative to policing. So in Project Greenlight, a business or an individual pays to have security cameras installed that go to a central feed to the police. Paying to do so gives them priority first response. Integrated was facial recognition software that notably did not work on darker skin tones. The green chairs, not green lights, sets up community safety, not dangerous surveilling. Green benches are made from shipping pallets to promote sitting outside and getting to know your neighbor. They also provide spaces of rest in public space where there are few. Several years ago, Freedom, Freedom hosted an Afrofuturism festival. They implemented a sliding scale fee asking white people to pay more for culture and black community. When one rapper pulled out, news outlets picked this up. They began to get threats of violence. They don't often share their activities as widely as this fest gets shared. I see what they are doing as pushing back against ideas of universal and open access. By making this an access-centered project, centering the various access needs, disability and beyond within a specific community. So scholar Amal Dublin has helped me make sense of Feedom Freedom's approach and this approach I see others taking as perhaps a form of partiality, as they've called it, that extends from strategies of separatism. So um, I think there's a, a lot more to say, but I'll just leave us um, by uh, dropping a, a current fundraiser to um, a Hale Bay project that they're building at Freedom Freedom in the chat if you wanna support. Um, and I think there's many, many rich questions embedded in the things that have been shared today. But I think um, I'll just end with what is the value of expanding what cripping means to include um, like experiences versus identity as central. Um, as Patty Burns 
said in a recent Sins Invalid event, we need to pan the crip. Um, but also how does like queering has been pretty overextended to the point it might lose its power. When does expanding cripping from a specific experience rooted in disability begin to limit its political potential? So thank you. And um, thank you for bearing with me, Irene, as I sped up because of time. This is Kevin. Thank you so much, Terene. And, um, and thank you everyone for, yes, for bearing with me some magical thinking in my <laughs> feeling that we could do all of this in 60 minutes. Um, one of the things that I am realizing through this session is that even if we did have 10 minutes, 15 minutes for all of us to talk together, there's a lot of scene setting and a lot of adjustment to conversation all together. And I haven't done a good job of that in the previous sessions. So I am going to think about that um, uh, and plan possibly for a way that we can actually talk about this material without being in such a rush to 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 it and and to get through it. So I uh, just want to apologize to everyone um, because the goal was to invite everyone to contribute to our survey of contemporary disability aesthetics and. If you do have something that you want to contribute, don't hold back. You could leave it in the chat or email it to me or leave it as a comment in our participation guide. Um, definitely still send anything that maybe you have been thinking about. Um, but I will follow up with a better plan for how we can all uh, be together in conversation that even if we had 15 minutes to do, I feel like we need more care for that. So um, thank you for being here. We have three more minutes before our access team um, will depart. So I'm going to stop talking now and just thank all of the folks who are holding this space with me. Thank you. We have such an incredible team, captioner, deaf interpreters, hearing interpreters, our access doula and describer. Um, thank you to everyone who is here, who is joining us. And thanks to everyone from the future who is watching this session later. Um, and apologies again for this time crunch. So two minutes transition out of the space as you need. Um, and thank you so much for being here.